Hi folks. Welcome to part three of our PowerPoint for this week. In this video, we're going to talk about the physiology of the respiratory system. We can break that down into three basic questions. First, how do we breathe? And by breathing, what I mean is how does atmosphere move in and out of our body? That's ventilation. The next question is why do these two gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, that are so important, move in opposite directions? And that takes us into the territory of gas exchange, which is either internal or external respiration, depending on where in the body it's happening. And then finally, also, we're going to talk about how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported oxygen, molecular through oxygen the body. Too, and carbon dioxide so remember, CO2 are both aerobic cellular respiration, it's the reason simple for the system existing. This so you so want to keep that in your, is going to in your head as you listen um, with the to the rest of the video. Gradient from okay the inside of the alveolus Facts into gases. the blood For and carbon dioxide chemistry also be a path. little bit of a review but most people haven't done that before they get to this class so this is sort of the minimum that you need to know about how gases behave in order to understand how the respiratory system functions so air is a solution of different gases we'll talk about which ones in a second the term pressure is in a way it's related to concentration. So pressure is the force that's exerted on the walls of a structure by molecules of gas or of liquid bouncing against them. The fluid that we're talking about with the respiratory system is atmosphere, but uh, liquids do the same. What's called total air pressure is the sum of partial pressures. So we don't go into sort of how you calculate partial pressure in this class. It has to do with how much of the gas is in the atmosphere, as well as the size of the container. Pressures measured in millimeters of mercury, which is mercury in the periodic table, is capital H, lowercase g. And you really don't need to remember any of the partial pressures. What you need to remember is that any sample of gas that's made of more than one kind of molecule, the total air pressure is the sum of the partial pressures. Gas will move down its total pressure gradient and it will also move down a partial pressure gradient. So you can have the same total pressure in two places, but if there are different partial pressures, you can still get gas exchange, which is in fact exactly what happens during external respiration. Okay, so this is what we breathe in and out. Oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, uh, argon, water, carbon dioxide. And what we inhale is about 21% oxygen, 
almost all nitrogen, which is completely inert. We do not have the ability, even though we desperately require nitrogen to build amino acids and nucleic acids, we can't access any of this nitrogen. It's, it's a triple covalent bond. So three pairs of electrons shared between the two nitrogen atoms. Even plants can't do that. They have to rely on commensal uh, fungi or bacteria to do it for them. There's a tiny bit of argon, water vapor, and in the atmosphere, a teeny tiny bit, although still way too much, carbon dioxide. What we exhale is about 16% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, same amount of argon, same amount of water vapor, and about 5% carbon dioxide. So yes, we contribute to global warming, as does every other living thing that produces carbon dioxide, including plants. They just actually, they have a net use of carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. So you can see, but you can see that the two places where there's significant gas exchange, just looking at the numbers, are with molecular oxygen, O2, and CO2. There's exchange of water vapor as well, but the overall amount is the same, unless you live in a desert. Okay, so there are, the beginning of the PowerPoint, I said there are three processes that we need to talk about, all of which are in the service of aerobic cellular respiration. Pulmonary ventilation or breathing, external respiration, and internal respiration. So pulmonary ventilation is what we're going to start with because unless you move atmosphere into the lungs and out of the lungs, you can't do gas exchange. But you got to remember that there's no gas exchange associated with breathing, right? Breathing and ventilation are the same thing. And when you ventilate, you're just moving atmosphere into the lungs and out of the lungs. It's not about the exchange of gases. Mechanism, the mechanism for ventilation works because the lungs lie inside the thoracic cavity, which is sealed from the external environment completely with the exception of the trachea. So there's only one way for air to move in and out of the lungs, and that's through the trachea. So this is an MRI, uh, frontal section MRI, and we've got liver here. We've got, this is the aorta, which isn't going to really look like the aorta in this image, but this is, this is the heart, and here you've got the lungs are showing up. And what you'll be able to see during this little movie is the change in the size of the thoracic cavity associated with ventilation. Now, this is ventilation, you know, the person's having this scan because they want to make sure that their lung function is okay. The lungs are showing up as black primarily because they're hollow. So there's not a lot of material for the for the MRI scanner to, which excites water molecules, yada, yada, yada. There's not a lot there to be imaged. So they're gonna say, take a deep breath. Say that one more time. You want to watch the size of the thoracic cavity, right? The diaphragm separates the abdominal pelvic cavity from the thoracic cavity. So right, you can see there's a huge when there's a chin the size of the thoracic cavity anyway, but you can truly see it when someone's asked to take a deep breath in. 
it is just remarkable what our bodies do. The, the really beautiful thing about ventilation is that the mechanism is just so incredibly elegant. The only thing we have to pay for, meaning the only thing that you actually have to, our, our bodies have to use energy for in this entire process of ventilation and external and internal respiration is breathing in. And the, the way inhalation works is that the diaphragm contracts right? It's this dome-shaped muscle. When it, remember, cells shorten when they contract. When this dome-shaped muscle contracts, it actually flattens, and that increases the, the vertical dimension of the thoracic cavity. So you pay for that muscle contraction. It's a skeletal muscle. The external intercostal muscles, when they contract and shorten, that pulls the sternum up and the ribs up and back. That increases the horizontal and the anterior posterior size of the cavity. And what we've done by doing that is essentially decrease the amount of air pressure inside the lungs. Now, when you have, remember I said that air will go down a pressure gradient. So right before we inhale, the pressure inside the lungs and outside the nose and the mouth is the same. But when you increase the size of the cavity without adding any new gas molecules, what you've done is lower the pressure inside the lungs. And that means gas will just flow in. You can't stop it. There's this very basic uh, thing, and that's part of the lab for this week that will introduce you to something called Boyle's Law, which in the simplest form is just that the the pressure of a gas is inversely related to the amount of space it has to take up because gases will always expand if they can. So if you keep the number of gas molecules the same and you decrease the space, that increases the pressure. If you increase the space, it will decrease the pressure. So when we inhale, what we're doing is increasing the size of the thoracic cavity by flattening the diaphragm, by contracting the intercostal muscles, which increases the other dimensions of the thoracic cavity, and air will stream into the lungs without any other work. So because muscle movement requires ATP, inspiration or inhalation is called the active part of ventilation. Just like active transport requires ATP and passive transport doesn't. In this case, right, we're paying to increase the size of the thoracic cavity. And after that, it's all physics. It's all about Boyle's law. Exhalation or expiration is passive, right? Muscles can't stay contracted forever. When they relax, the size of the thoracic cavity returns because muscles are elastic. They go back to their pre-contraction length. So they get the intercostal muscles go back to their resting length, which is longer than the contracted length. The same thing is true with the diaphragm becomes dome-shaped again. Now that decreases the size of the thoracic cavity, which increases pressure inside the lungs, and so air is forced out. Part of the difficulty of sort of getting this in our heads, I think, is that we're, well, it's twofold. One, um, it doesn't feel when we're breathing at rest like air is being forced into or out of our lungs, 
right? But in fact, it is. And the second thing I think that's confusing is that everybody knows it is possible to forcefully exhale. And so if you are, you know, I don't know, you're in a yoga class or something, or you're exercising and you're forcefully exhaling because the yoga teacher told you to, or because you can't help it because you went for a run, that does require ATP, forceful exhalation does. But we, again, we're focused on just breathing at rest. And it's really important that it doesn't cost our body a lot of energy to do that. Again, because the reason we breathe is because we need the oxygen to get ATP produced. So this is this little animation all the way on the right is, is showing you that change in size of the thoracic cavity and the accompanying movement of atmosphere shown by the little lake blue bubbles. And then all the way on the left is a lateral view of inhalation. So you've got the diaphragm more flat compared to as it is on the, in the middle panel where it's more dome shaped. And you can see that the, the size of the, the lungs is different and the size of the thoracic cavity. So the, the plus and minus in these, in the left image and in the center image refer to differences in total air pressure, not partial air pressure. And that's, that's a really important thing to keep in your head because ventilation is about total pressure, total atmospheric pressure. Right. Okay. So two ways that we control ventilation with the nervous system and then by detecting the chemical composition of blood. So nervous control, not surprisingly, involves the brainstem. So there are respiratory control centers in the brainstem that send out signals for the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm to contract. These are skeletal muscles, right? So this is one of those places where skeletal muscles are being used to, for, I don't wanna say it's exactly reflexive, but you certainly can't breathing because your brain will make you pass out if you hold your breath for too long. So it has ways around, our brains have ways around <laughs> our desire to hold our breath. So you have contraction of those muscles. The intercostal nerves make the intercostal muscles contract. The phrenic nerve stimulates the diaphragm to contract. You don't need to remember the names of the nerves, but you should know the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. Now, within the alveoli are stretch receptors. Those stretch receptors, right, when you take a breath in, when you inhale, even without it being a deep breath, you have expansion of the inner sacs of the alveoli because gas pushes out to take on the space of the container that it's in. So that's detected by the stretch receptors and that information goes back and inhibits the respiratory control centers. It says, okay, turn off that essentially inhibits the, the motor neurons that are telling the muscles of respiration to contract. Once there's no more stretch, the respiratory control centers aren't inhibited any longer and they send out a signal. So it's sort of, it literally is like flipping a switch off and on. Chemical control of ventilation involves the same respiratory control centers, but chemical sensors that detect blood pH. So the pulmonary artery is this ginormo one right here. The aorta is the one that is has an arch, and then I always say it's like it has a mohawk. Um, so the aorta and then the their arteries, they have chemical sensors in them that can detect hydrogen ion concentration. So as we'll talk about, carbon dioxide is carried through the blood in a form that's referred to as bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ions. So when you have a lot of CO2 produced, 
that leads to a decrease in the pH of blood. That is detected by these sensors and that feeds into the respiratory control centers, which then send commands like get yourself in gear, you need to start contracting more frequently, which then leads to more frequent stretching. So you end up with this cycle. Okay, so oxygen is transported in the blood, inside red blood cells, well, attached to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a huge protein made of four globin subunits, each of which has what's called a heme group. Each heme group, which is shown as yellow over here, can grab a single O2 molecule. So in the lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen is very high inside the alveoli. So the little lowercase p by the O2 means the partial pressure of oxygen. So the partial pressure of oxygen inside the alveoli is high particularly compared to the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood in the lungs. And so what you have is diffusion of oxygen into the lungs. And that leads to the formation of what's referred to as oxyhemoglobin, which is just hemoglobin with oxygen, conceptually sort of oxygen grabbing on there. So carbon dioxide is transported very differently. Carbon dioxide, a little of it can be carried in the red blood cells, but most of it is immediately chemically converted by combining with oxygen into a molecule called bicarbonate, which is H2CO3. So We've got a red blood cell here, right? And inside the red blood cell is an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. You guys don't need to remember that name. But as, car as the hydrogen ions and the bicarbonate ions enter, come into the lungs, they re-enter red blood cells and are converted into carbon dioxide and water. Right? And that's where the CO2 that we exhale comes from. The, if you're in the tissues of the body where CO2 and water are produced during aerobic cellular respiration, they're pulled into red blood cells and the same enzyme converts them into bicarbonate and then immediately into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. And that's how carbon dioxide is transported through the blood which is why the more CO2 you produce, the more hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion you have, and so the more acidic your blood becomes. Now we're getting into the territory of gas exchange. The whole point of or the whole reason we have a respiratory system is that we do aerobic cellular respiration, right? So we've got the formula there, oxygen, molecular oxygen and glucose during aerobic cellular respiration produces carbon dioxide and water along with energy that is captured and used to take um, adenosine diphosphate back to adenosine triphosphate by reattaching the the third phosphate group the inorganic phosphate external respiration occurs in the lungs only and refers to the exchange of gases between the atmosphere and pulmonary capillaries so blood inside pulmonary capillaries internal respiration is gas exchange every place else in the body so between blood in systemic capillaries and tissue cells in our tissues. It's actually exchange between blood and tissue fluid. I'll show you that in a second. And again, right, so this is gas exchange. 
Ventilation is just moving atmosphere in and out of the lungs. It doesn't have to do with the partial pressure, which is exactly what internal and external respiration have to do with. So I want to remind you again that if it's blue and you're in the lungs, we're talking about an artery or an arterial. Um, so this is blood coming from the lungs that's low in oxygen and high in CO2. Got pulmonary capillaries that lead to pulmonary venules and then eventually pulmonary veins, which carry blood back to the heart. Okay. The respiratory zone is the alveoli, the alveoli and pulmonary capillaries. So we've got the capillary beds shown going from blue to sort of purple to red as they pick up oxygen, we've got pulmonary artery in blue. Really, this would be arterial, but that's okay. Pulmonary venule. You've got mucosal lining in the duct work, little mucus gland. Got an alveolar duct, the alveolar sacs. There's some connective tissue associated with the air sacs as well, although nowhere near as much as it was associated with the ducts. And then if we look inside an alveolar sac, we see that there's a central this would be the respiratory bronchial, and then you have alveolar ducts going into individual alveoli. And the sort of the entryway to the alveolar sac is called the atrium, which is a general term for entryway. So here, what we're looking at is a cartoon of a cross section through an alveolar, small alveolar sac so we've got an alveolar duct, three little bits of um, alveoli, the arterial end of a capillary, and the venual end, the lumen of an alveolus. So each of these little structures that I'm hovering over represent a squamous epithelial cell. And that's exactly the same kind of tissue that's used to make capillaries. So the partial pressure of oxygen is much higher inside the, in the lumen of the alveolus than it is in the blood. So oxygen diffuses with its concentration gradient or with its partial pressure gradient, right? That's why I said you can think of partial pressure as being related to concentration. So it diffuses oxygen oxygen is going to diffuse in because it's diffusing with its partial pressure gradient. CO2 is going to go in exactly the opposite direction, but for the same reason. The partial pressure of CO2 is much higher in the pulmonary capillaries than it is in the atmosphere contained inside the alveolus. So that's external respiration, gas exchange between the atmosphere, which is, has been pulled into the alveoli, or the alveolus in this case, by ventilation and the blood in the pulmonary system. So this is exactly what I just said, but in words. So for folks that like things written out. Internal respiration is powered by the same mechanism, which is differences in partial pressure and diffusion across simple squamous epithelium. So any place in the body other than the lungs, any place other than pulmonary capillaries that surround the alveoli, you have internal respiration. And in this case, the partial pressures are exactly opposite to what they are in the lungs. One way to help yourself remember that is to keep the, keep the formula for cellular respiration in your head. Glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. Our cells are constantly doing that, which means they're constantly using up the oxygen and they're constantly producing CO2. So there's more CO2 in the interstitial 
fluid or tissue fluid, interstitial means the space between. So all of our cells are bathed in tissue or interstitial fluid, and the cells are constantly using up oxygen. So what that means is that the partial pressure in systemic capillaries, which is what we call all the capillaries other than pulmonary capillaries, the partial pressure of oxygen is much higher than it is in the tissue fluid. So oxygen will diffuse out of the blood and into the tissue fluid, and then will diffuse into cells from there. CO2 diffuses out of working cells and then down or with its partial pressure gradient into the blood, where it's then gonna be immediately converted inside red blood cells to bicarbonate and then to hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion, which is how it would be transported to the lungs for disposal. CO2 is higher in the tissue, tissue fluid than blood um, so that means the partial pressure is higher and it's going to move out of tissue fluid and into the bloodstream. The exact opposite is true for the partial pressure of oxygen. It's constantly used up, which means that it will be lower in tissue fluid. The partial pressure is lower than tissue fluid than it is in systemic capillaries. So it will diffuse out of the blood and into the tissue fluid. So we're going to talk about this a lot more next week. So you don't need to worry about the names of arteries and veins, just focused on, focus on pulmonary, meaning vessels within the lungs. Systemic means everything else other than the blood vessels that are surrounding the alveoli. So external respiration is gas exchange with the external environment where the partial pressure of oxygen is higher inside the alveolus than in the blood. The partial pressure of CO2 is higher in blood than alveolus, and that leads to the pattern of gas exchange we see. We refer to the blood flow between the heart and the lungs and back as being the pulmonary circuit or pulmonary circulation internal respiration you want to associate with the systemic circuit of the cardiovascular system or systemic circulation and that's because it's happening every place in the body other than other than surrounding the alveoli and in this case again the partial pressures are reversed from what you see in the lungs and that leads to a reversal in the direction that oxygen and co2 are going to move. So if you have disease in the upper or lower respiratory tract, the body's homeostasis is threatened. And if you think about why that's the case, you might say, well, because it means we have a hard time breathing. And I would say, I'm going to put on my kindergartner hat and say again, why? <laughs> right? The bottom line answer to this question is that if you have dysfunction in the respiratory system, homeostasis is threatened because aerobic cellular respiration is threatened and nothing happens without ATP. And the whole point of respiration, aerobic cellular respiration is to regenerate ADP into ATP so that cells can pay for the work they need to do to stay alive. When you think about respiratory disease at the level of individual alveoli, so what's happening in the respiratory zone, you've got a pulmonary capillary and a little alveolus with an alveolar duct in my cartoon. So what's the normal healthy pattern of CO2 and oxygen movement? The CO2 is going to move from blood into the atmosphere inside the alveolus, and oxygen is going to move with its partial pressure gradient from inside the alveolus into the blood. If I have fibrosis in the lungs, so fibrosis means scarring, increase in connective tissue essentially, 
what would be the effect of that? Well, if, if you have decreased elasticity because you have more rigid connective tissue, the lungs, the, the alveoli aren't going to be able to expand as much. And so there you're going to have less gas exchange. Less gas exchange means a buildup of CO2 in the blood. And so a lowering of blood pH, which might denature blood proteins. And also a decrease in the ability of oxygen to enter the body. If you have fluid in the alveoli, in this case, a whole heck of a lot of fluid, then you can have gas exchange or you will have some gas exchange in water, but so much less that you're going to die before you can generate enough ATP to, to deal with the issue, which is what happens with drowning and when someone's lungs fill with fluid because of pulmonary edema or uh, pneumonia, for example. So COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It includes emphysema. Emphysema is when the air sacs, the, the alveoli essentially burst. And so you have less surface area for gas exchange. And then chronic bronchitis in the US. So the combination of inflammation, which reduces the size of the airways and less surface area because the alveoli have been blown leads to difficulty with getting enough oxygen into the body and getting enough CO2 out. People with COPD are tired because they're not getting enough oxygen. They're not able to regenerate enough ATP. Lung cancer is it's less lethal than it used to be, but still quite lethal. All cancers are the result of uncontrolled cell division. And the cancerous tissue eventually replaces tissue that is that's functional. It's doing what the organ is meant to do. Most lung cancer is the result of smoking, but there are also exposure to radon is the second most common risk factor, as is working in an asbestos mine or anytime, anytime you end up with material that is stuck in your lungs, it's an irritant and inflammation is associated with with cancer. In the case of smoking and radon, both of their components in tobacco smoke that are what are called mutagens. So they lead, mutagens cause mutations, which are changes in the DNA. And those changes, if enough of them build up and they're in genes that are involved in controlling cell division, you can end up with runaway cell division. Our entire body is at risk from smoking-related illness. But in terms of cancer, we have the obvious suspects, lung, mouth, esophagus, larynx, nasal cavity. But because the carcinogens or the mutagens in tobacco smoke are absorbed into the blood, there's also a higher risk for bladder, kidney, pancreatic, stomach, and for reasons I don't understand, cervical cancer. All tobacco, all kinds of tobacco cause damage to the body. doesn't matter if it's a cigarette or a cigar or chew or what when I was in college, I'll dip stuff. It's like finely ground tobacco that's mixed with fiberglass. And the fiberglass essentially abrades the capillaries in your mouth and leads to increased absorption of nicotine. Nicotine is not, uh, in general, nicotine is not the problem, which is why if you have a healthy cardiovascular system and you smoke, switching to nicotine gum, even if it's for the rest of your life, is a wise choice. There's also passive smoking or secondhand smoking, which has the same, a lower lower risk than if you're an active smoker, but still increases the risk for the same kinds of problems. And it turns out there's third-hand smoke as well. Um, third-hand smoke is just a function of physics. What goes up comes down. So all of the, not all of the 
bad stuff that's in tobacco stuff is taken into the body. And when a smoker exhales, right, if, if they're smoking in any kind of confined, confined space, that they exhale the smoke, the particles fall to the ground and accumulate on the surf surfaces. So babies and young kids who are on the ground a lot um, or on the floor a lot and put their hands in their mouth a lot are at the highest risk for third hand smoke. So not to be total Debbie Downer here, here is this lovely graph from CVS Health, which shows you how rapidly your body can recover from the effects of, of smoking, right? Sometimes people say, well, be really fatalistic about it. Like I've smoked for five years, I'm addicted. It's why I'm just, I'm doomed. But in fact, the second you stop within 30 minutes, your body starts to return to homeostasis. And you guys can take a look at this in, in the PowerPoint in more detail. So this little animated GIF is like the one about muscle contraction is showing you sort of, well, it's showing you ventilation on the, oops, on the right side or the left side and then external respiration. 